What was it like being raised by Ronald Reagan and, and by your mother, Jane? 1953, I walked away from God. I walked away from my mother. I walked away from my father. I walked away from everybody in 1953. My dad looked at me and says, you know something, Michael? I just don't believe in nepotism. And I walked out of the Ambassador Hotel that night thinking to myself, I should have voted for the other guy. How did being adopted impact your pro-life views? I wish more American kids were adopted into families. Unfortunately, the laws we have in the United States makes it tough. And later on, it was reported that he expressed regret for legalizing some of these instances of abortion while he was governor because he felt that it was the wrong thing to do. He always sat there and said, you know, it's just all the people who are pro-choice have already been born. I thought that was one of the great lines he ever, he ever gave. But he was passionately pro-life. And I think part of it might have been because... Hello, everybody. Welcome back to the Lila Rose podcast. Today, we've got a great treat. We're going to be interviewing Michael Reagan, who is the son of President Ronald Reagan. Michael is here to share about his story, and it's some of it heartbreaking and some of it very inspiring, about his upbringing. He's also going to be talking about the new film, Reagan, which if you haven't already seen it, I encourage that you do. It is an incredible film about the life and the fight of Ronald Reagan, fighting communism and fighting for this country. Michael is an author, a political commentator, and a radio host. He also has a lot of incredible stories to share about the impact of his relationship with his father and the lessons that he learned. I hope that you enjoy this episode. Michael Reagan, thank you so much for joining the podcast. Good to be with you. Thank you. It's a real honor to have you on, truly. I mean, I am a huge admirer of your work and, of course, of your father and his incredible impact on this country and the world. So really pumped to get this opportunity to talk to you. Thank you. So let's jump right in and start from the beginning, and then we'll go forward in your in your uh, amazing life. <laughs> Starting from the beginning, you were raised, you're the son of Ronald Reagan. And of course, millions of people around the world are curious about what that must have been like. I know you get asked this question a lot. <laughs> what was it like being raised by Ronald Reagan and, and by your mother, Jane? Well, to be honest with you, because they were divorced when I was like three, I was really raised by my mother because that's who I lived with. I would see my dad on weekends, mm -hmm. horseback riding, you know, shoot ground squirrels, go swimming, all those kinds of things, which is really great. Dad was a, a pushover. I mean, the reason the kids in the family didn't like our mothers is because our mothers are the ones that, in fact, spanked us. They're the ones that hold us accountable. Dad was an easy, easy mark, unless you were Russian. And then, you know, then you were. <laughs> but the reality of it was, he was just, he was, Dad was a pushover uh, with everything, really. Um, Mom mm -hmm. raised me and. You know, many of us in Hollywood back in the day, we all went to boarding school because our parents were actors. They were out on location. So most all of us were raised mm -hmm. by nannies and maids. And we were, I went to a military school when I was in fifth grade. I was at boarding school when I was six years old, come home on weekends and, and what have you, and reintroduced myself to my family. So I'm, I'm the kid that was away all week with, with my sister Maureen. So that's kind of how we were, in fact, raised. Uh, in Hollywood back, you know, in the day, uh, we are, like I say to people, we are members of the Lucky Sperm Club uh, because we had parents who were famous, went to great restaurants, we went with them, Chasen's and all the other places. So that was great. But you missed your family on weeks during the week because you were in boarding school and you only saw them really on the weekends. And those weekends, you used it all up. What was the lessons that you learned having an upbringing like that, which is pretty unique, and especially being raised by two parents who were Hollywood stars, and then, of course, your dad becoming you know, incredibly successful in politics, being the governor of California, then went on to become the president of the United States. These are huge roles that your parents had, both on film and in real life. How did that affect you as a kid? And, and looking back on it now as an adult, what would you say are the lessons, both maybe the good and the bad ones that you learned? Well, I learned from my mother not to make her mad because she had a riding crop and hit me 10 times in the back of each leg. Uh, she only had to do that once. And I went, hmm, that's not going to work out very well for me. Uh, I am probably the way I am. And my wife, Colin, would tell you that I am the way I am because of my mother, uh, politically because of my dad. But I am the way I am because of my mother. My mother held me accountable to everything and anything. Um, you know, when I wanted a 10-speed bike at 10 years old, uh, she made me sign a note with her. And she loaned me the money for that 10-speed bike. And I said, why in the heck are you making me borrow money from you when all my friends in Beverly Hills are getting bikes given to them 
by their parents. And she said, because I build men, I don't build boys. I don't want you to be a 40-year-old child. So sign here. So at 10 years old, I was in debt to my mother. I said, what am I going to do to pay you back? She says, you now have a bike. You can deliver papers. Oh, I never thought of that. So I started selling papers in front of church on Sunday morning. And I would split the profits with my mother until I paid her back what she loaned me to get that bike. Uh, You know, that was a great lesson then. But, you know, when you're 10 years old, you're not thinking about lessons they're teaching you. You're going like, just give me the damn bike. (laughs) You, You find out later on, oh, that was a good lesson. Because she did the same lesson with me when I started my natural radio talk show back in 1991. And I was making no money to get it off the ground. I was driving to San Diego and back every single day, 272 miles every day to do the show and try to get off the ground with no money. And I called my mother on the phone. I said, can you help us out? You know, we got the two kids at home, Cameron and Ashley. And, you know, Colleen's doing the best she can. She has a travel business. And my mom said, I can help you out. I said, great. What can you do? She said, I can tell you this. Shut up and keep driving. She hung up on me. I called her back. and said, well, you hang up on me? She said, yes, I did. I said, why? She said, did somebody die and say you didn't have to pay your dues like everybody else? I said, no. Shut up and keep driving. She hung up on me. And that show lasted from 1991, 92, till I walked away in 2009. Now, my dad, on the other hand, you know, he was, the, he was weekends, great. I mean, I learned about America from my dad, riding in the right front seat of a station wagon on any given Saturday morning, regaling me with songs of the military, Army, Navy, Marine Corps, Coast Guard, stories about America. That's where I learned about America mm-hmm. and, and what have you. And that was great, learning those lessons. The problem is today, we're leaving those lessons to the school and saying they're not doing their job. We're not leaving them to the parents and letting them do their job. The movie Reagan came out recently. Mm -hmm. It was a big hit, amazingly done movie. And it depicted your dad and then your mother, their early relationship, And, you know, there were some scenes that showed it. And then later on, obviously, your father would go on and remarry again. And and now Nancy Mm -hmm. Reagan. What was that? How did that impact you the way that the film depicted it? Do you think the film did a good job in their depiction of your family? What did you like? What did you not like? Well, I shouldn't weigh that much. Um, (laughs) For first thing, my mom wasn't that heavy. Uh, But leave that by the side. Penelope came up to me afterwards, we were talking, and she said, you okay with the way we depicted your mother? I said, you probably depicted my mother because the stories I've been talking and telling Mark and John and everybody 15 years when they came up with the idea of the movie, I was kind of giving backstories to a lot of things that ended up in the movie. And one of the stories I told him was, 1980s, my dad gave an actual speech on television. I called my mom. I said, Mom, did you see Dad's speech on television? And what did you think of it? And she said, Michael, I didn't like it in 1940. What makes you think I'd like it today? And Penelope said, thank you for the story. I said, no, my mom didn't like politics. Never did. And But she did vote for him twice. So everything was depicted correctly about my mother. Because, you know, Dad was going home sleeping with a gun under his pillow because what was going on with the unions in Hollywood. And... He was busy with that while mom was winning Academy Awards and Golden Globes and what have you. In fact, my mom has two stars in the Hollywood Walk of Fame. Dad has one. She has handprints and footprints of grandma's Chinese. Dad has none. And so they really depicted her absolutely 100% on target. I thought they did a great job through the whole movie uh, with Nancy, the horseback riding back in 1952, they were interviewing Nancy for a movie magazine, said, what do you think about uh, riding a horse? And she said, I only learned to ride a horse to capture a husband. And (laughs) she did. And she did. So Mm -hmm. uh, it was an interesting life. And, you know, like the library Mm -hmm. refers to me as the prequel, uh, because all the stories they have, I have a backstory to their stories. And so I did a lot of that you know, some of that with the movie Mm. and they were able to use it, which was really nice. Your mother and and yourself, you would later become Catholic and you have very 
passionate about your faith. How have you seen that change your mother's life, Jane's life? And then I'd love to hear how it has changed your life. A big thank you to our sponsor, GoodRanchers.com. Good Ranchers is American meat delivered. Did you know that up to 90% of the meat in your grocery store is not from the United States? It might say USA on the label, but it's not actually from American Ranchers. It's imported and packaged in the United States. Good Ranchers is 100% sourced from the United States. And when you choose GoodRanchers.com, you're choosing more than just delicious meat. You're choosing to support local American farms and ranchers, standing up for transparency and safety in our food supply. At my house, chicken nuggets are an easy and kid-friendly meal, but I'm concerned about the seed oils and the additives in the brands that we purchase at the grocery store. Thankfully, Good Ranchers has created a new seed oil-free nugget. No other nugget on the market offers a pure seed oil-free recipe that prioritizes your family's health without sacrificing flavor or crunch. And right now, if you subscribe at GoodRanchers.com for a limited time, you can get a free add-on for a full four years or until the next presidential election. That means that when you subscribe to any of the Good Ranchers boxes, you get to decide if you want free chicken breast, Angus ground beef, applewood smoked bacon, or wild-caught salmon in every one of your orders for four years. So go to GoodRanchers.com today. Use my code Lila at checkout to get up to $1,200 of free add-ons. That's GoodRanchers.com, American Meat Delivered. Well, my mother and I and my sister, Rory, were baptized December 8th, 1954, Church of the Good Shepherd, uh, Father John Osborne, back in 1954. And my mother, you know, was really brought to Catholicism by uh, God, Loretta Young, uh, who was a dear friend of hers, uh, and, and what have you. And so, you know, Maureen and I started Catholic schools with the Good Shepherd School, Maureen with Marymount, so on and so forth. And... Uh, it changed my mom's life dramatically. I mean, she never missed a day of mass. She never missed communion. Uh, in fact, my mother was buried at his Dominican nun to the third order, full regalia, mm. uh, back when she passed away, 2007. So she was very much into it. I remember I was speaking at a Legatus event in Bermuda way back when, quite a few years ago. And uh, uh, Cardinal, uh, there was one of the cardinals was there that worked with Pope John Paul. And uh, they introduced me and to a big applause. I said, well, thank you for the applause. I really appreciate that. Uh, but you really are applauding the fact that Ronald Reagan is my father. You're not applauding me. You're applauding who my parents are, who my father is. I said, but let me tell you about my mother. And I started telling about my mom being buried as an American nun third order to, a, to the, oh, I thought we didn't know that. I said, yeah, I know you didn't know that. I said, so when we're all gone, and we reach the pearly gates and walk into heaven. And you see my dad. Look three floors above him, because that's where you'll see my mother. <laughs> and I said, I'm thinking of Dominican nun the third order. No matter how much you love Ronald Reagan, it's a little bit above a politician in, in heaven <laughs> when, you, when you get there. So it changed her quite a bit. Uh, I went through things as a child. I walked away from God. 1953, I walked away from God. I walked away from my uh, mother. I walked away from my father. I walked away from everybody in 1953. I didn't find my way back until after I met Colleen and going into the 1980s and, and 1990s, if you will, uh, coming back to Catholicism. But now, you know, I'm I back in. My, uh, my wife is now Catholic because of the trip to Bermuda. Uh, my son, Cameron, my daughter-in-law, Susanna. My daughter Ashley. I mean, so you know, we're all we're all in the building because I know when we go to heaven, my mother, if we're not Catholic, she may turn us away. <laughs> Your dad had a very deep faith himself, and mm-hmm. his whole time in politics, he and I think the movie Reagan depicted this well. He was really driven in, and in, in, he had a sense of calling to stand up to evil, to fight for the good, obviously to fight for America's future. That fight most, I think, uh, played itself out in the fight against communism. He was also passionately pro-life in addition to being against communism. What was it like for you? I guess at this time you would have been a a young man (laughs) and maybe you were not living your faith for a period of time. What was it like for you to watch your dad in his political career? How did that impact you? Well, 
you gotta go back. You know, like, you gotta go back. Like, I'm 20 years old when he decides to run for governor. You know, and all I'm thinking about is honestly, God, I hope he wins. It'll be easier to get dates. I mean, I could care less what he believed in. I was only saying, hey, my dad, governor of the state of California, is that going to be a great pickup line or what? I mean, that's what I'm thinking. Uh, so I'm really happy when he becomes governor of the state of California at, at that point. But that's when my first move into politics uh, back in that day. But, you know, there's so much that comes before him really getting into that. You know, there was General Electric Theater, which was shown in the movie, you know, when he did that. Uh, and then he was, you know, in Las Vegas before that doing a stand-up act, which was just horrific, and it showed that in the movie. But a lot of people don't know about General Electric Theater that Bobby Kennedy, the brother of the President of the United States, you know, John F. Kennedy, got a hold of the head of General Electric back in 1962 and was basically intimidating him by saying, you know, your government contracts are coming up very shortly. And the head of GE is trying to figure out why is the Attorney General of the United States calling? And we find out about those government contracts. It would be much easier to get them. We found a way to get rid of that guy who was going around the country, all those GE plants, speaking ill against my brother, and within about 48 or 72 hours of that phone call, General Electric Theater was canceled. My dad was fired and had no job. Now, where did I learn that? Sitting at the dinner table with my father, Nancy, and my sister on a Sunday night when he's telling us, I'm not going to be on anymore, and telling us the story exactly why. But what happens? He now is a little upset. He's a Democrat. My sister Maureen, who's the Republican in the family, browbeats my dad into changing from a Democrat to a Republican. He always says the, the Democrat Party left me. Yeah, they did. Left in the lurch without a job. But he now had time to sit down and pen a brand new speech, which he would lose, use for Barry Goldwater. And it was called The Time for Choosing which now launches his career into politics to the governorship of the state of California and beyond. So that's why they call me the prequel. Incredible. Did What was it like? Would you see your dad working on his speeches, working on his, you know, when he would get into campaigning, working on his campaigns? What was that like for you as a young man? And how, what did you observe about your well, father? Well, Maury and I, you know, Maury and I were out campaigning speaking of Republican women's groups in 1965, mm -hmm. 66. So I was able to vote because I turned 21 uh, before the election. And I remember a few years ago, I was speaking to a uh, Republican women's group and one would raise her hand and said, Mr. Reagan, I said, call me Mike. And she said, uh, how long have you been speaking to Republican women's clubs? I said, looked at her and this is like maybe 10 years ago. And I said, ma'am, I probably spoke to your mother. That's how long I've speaking to Republican women's groups since that period of time. Learned about politics from my sister. Uh, you know, like she was the first one to tell me. I said, what's the difference between a Democrat and Republican? She says, the Democrats go to bed every night hoping you never figure it out. Republicans go to bed every night hoping someday you do figure it out. And we're still in that position, you know, how many years later, in fact. And... Uh, so she was very, Maureen was very instrumental in my dad moving to the Republican Party. Uh, ultimately, all of us into the Republican Party, mm -hmm. if you will, because you didn't want to fight Maureen on any issue at all, uh, because she seemed to win on those days. But campaigning for my dad in 1965 was, mm -hmm. was great. Uh, campaigned in 76, campaigned in 1980, 84. So I was, you know, campaigning for my dad. I didn't want to make him mad. I was, in fact, when he won the governorship in California in 1966, you know what I did? First question I asked him, I asked him for a job in government because I thought every politician gives their kids jobs. My my dad was not named. Did you get it? My dad was not named Biden. He was named Reagan, unfortunately. And uh, my dad looked at me and says, you know something, Michael? I just don't believe in nepotism. 
And I walked out of the Ambassador Hotel that night thinking to myself, I should have voted for the other guy. Because that guy does believe in nepotism. My dad doesn't believe in nepotism. <laughs> what a terrible, what a terrible choice I made. It's a fair, you know, like that. But uh, yeah, it's, it's a great moment together. Michael, earlier in the interview, you described your dad as a pushover when you were mm-hmm. a kid. There have been many of his critics who have described him as, you know, bumbling, not very intelligent. He was accused of this, of course, by those that were against him politically, um, you know, even being naive, not really having his wits about him. And yet, on the other hand, he's given some of the most consequential speeches and done some of the most consequential policy. You know, they called it the the, the, the era of Reagan mm-hmm. um, in the last century. What's your take on all of that? Was he uh, a... a a pushover when you saw him in his work in politics. No, what was the guiding light for him? How how do what is your take on Guy, that? Guiding light, you know, if you watch the movie, he had more trouble with his own staff than anybody else getting things done. He knew what he wanted to accomplish, and anybody who disagrees with you is going to make up stories. Always bumbling, he's this, he's that, and what have you. Never saw him, but the only time I saw him bumble things was the first debate with Walter Mondale. And Nancy was completely right. Let him be Reagan and quit giving him so much information. And let dad be Reagan in the second debate. End of story. He ends up walking away with 49 states. But back to another question you asked me about religion with my dad. Because he used to go to church every Sunday morning with everybody and go to Bel Air Press. And I never went with him. And I asked him one time, I said, why did you never ask me to go with you when I was living with you when I was in high school for a couple of years? He said, well, because your mother raised you Catholic, I didn't want to make her mad. I said, okay, that that makes sense. But you know something else? The last time I flew on Air Force One with him, and I was just on Air Force One at the library the other day, telling the story. Uh, As we were landing at Point Magoo on a good Friday of 1988, he counted out nine on his fingers. I said, what's important about the number nine? He says, in nine more months, I'll no longer be president. I said, something you're looking forward to? He says, yes, I am. I said, why? He said, you know, Michael, ever since I looked out the rear window of the limousine on March 30th, 1981, and saw people laying in their own blood with bullets meant for me, I have not wanted to go and visit a church or places where other people can be, again, uh, in the way of bullets meant for me and put them in harm's way. So I haven't gone to church. People talk about I haven't gone to church. Well, I haven't gone to church. Because I haven't wanted to put people in harm's way. So I'm looking forward to no longer be, you know, president anymore where I can go to church each and every Sunday. And when he left the presidency January 20th of 89, he never missed a Sunday in church. Even when he had Alzheimer's and couldn't go, the minister would go to the house. And the minister always say, I went to the house to minister to President Reagan. And President Reagan ministered to me. Hmm. And that goes back to his mother and his family bringing in Dixon and Tampa, Illinois. Michael, you were adopted Mm -hmm. and you are passionately pro-life. You are outspoken about your pro-life conviction. Your dad was Mm pro-life. How has being adopted, how how did being adopted impact your pro-life views? We Heart Nutrition provides wholesome supplements and vitamins, and they have wholesome values. Not only does We Heart Nutrition use the highest quality, research-backed ingredients that are always in the most bio-available form, We Heart Nutrition is also unapologetically pro-life. In fact, 10% of every sale of their vitamins is given back to pregnancy care centers. You may not know this, but many of the major multivitamin companies are owned by corporations that donate directly to Planned Parenthood. With We Heart Nutrition, it's the opposite. It's not only a best-in-class vitamin, but they're donating 10% of their proceeds back to pro-life resource centers. We Heart Nutrition sells vitamins for women at every age and stage of life, including options for preconception, pregnancy, postpartum, and postmenopause. So go to weheartnutrition.com today. Use the code Lila for 20% at checkout. Now, when you place an order of $50 or more at weheartnutrition.com, you will receive a free signature bamboo capsule box. These boxes are adorable and make taking your vitamins or traveling with them easy. Check out weheartnutrition.com and use the code Lila at checkout for 20% off. That's weheartnutrition.com. How did being adopted impact your pro-life views? Well, because when I used to do radio, one of the questions I put forward, I say, if you had Okay, if you had an opinion, I just asked, all of you have been adopted. Would you have rather had the other choice? 
Because the other choice is abortion. <laughs> There's your choices. Abortion or adoption. I always come down on the side of adoption <laughs> in that way. And, uh, and, you know, I was lucky. I was adopted, you know, into this family. Uh, I wish more American kids were adopted into families. Unfortunately, the laws we have in the United States makes it tough to adopt in the United States. So people go to foreign countries and adopt from foreign countries instead of adopting their children are here. There's 100,000 kids in foster care who would say, I want a family. I want a forever home. We should be doing that. The churches should be challenged to have their parishioners who want children but can't have them themselves to adopt from the foster care system within their neighborhood, within their county, within their system. Because foster care is just a, it's a, it was a train wreck, uh, but it's a, it's an automatic pipeline to human sex trafficking, because we're sending kids out on the street when they're 18 years of age, they don't really have an education, uh, and nothing, and we put them out there, and all they can do is sell their bodies for money, and that's what they do. Not everybody's a, a Simone, you know, who was adopted also. Not everybody's like that. Or me, lucky enough, most of them, you have 400,000 kids in foster care in Los Angeles, 100,000 available for adoption. What's going to happen to the ones who age out at 18? They're going to end up on the streets, and they're going to be hit hit on by traffickers, and they're going to be trafficked for sex. That's what's going to happen. And so we need to really do something to clean up the foster care system, and we need to really challenge churches to have their parishioners adopt U.S. kids into their families instead of foreign kids. Not that I have think they have foreign kids. I have adopted niece from Uganda because it was e- it was easier for my sister Marie to adopt a child from Uganda than adopt a child in the United States of America. Think about that one for a moment. And her dad was president of the United States, and George Bush was president when she did that. That that shouldn't be able to happen. It should be easier to get them here than there. So I am very pro life in that way. But something else. I was adopted. Nancy was adopted. My mother, Jane, was adopted. We are a piecemeal family. And when I talk to adopted groups, they say, think what would have happened if Nancy had been aborted, Jane had been aborted, I had been aborted. Think about the Reagan family now. Where are they? They're not here because they were aborted. Instead, they were adopted in. And look at the difference they made. Jane, Dad, Nancy, whatever you whatever I'm doing, you know, not only in the United States, but around the world, around the globe. Was your adoption, was that something that you think also inspired your father to be pro-life? How did your adoption, in your view, impact r- your father's politics? You know, it, it might have. I, I, I don't know if it did or not, really. Um, mm-hmm. But I know he never, never thought, you know, I was always a kid, never thought of me as adopted. Now, I am still teased on the internet, I don't have a right to say anything because I would. Ronald Reagan really, really wasn't my father, you know. I, I still get that it just because there's mean, terrible people out there <laughs> in the world, and they and they do that. Uh, but Dad and I really never, we never, you know, talked about it. My mother and I only talked about it one time, and that's back when I was, I think, four or five years old. Maureen was in boarding school at Chadwick already. Um, I would be there the next year. So I guess maybe I was five or six and she was four years ahead of me. And because I was at home, I knew what she was going to get for Christmas. So when she came over for Christmas break, I'm a little brother. I'm trying to be cool with my older sister. And I said to her, I said, Mm -hmm. Hey, I know what you're getting for Christmas. And her, I'm sorry, I know what you're getting for your birthday because her birthday is January 4th. Mom's was the fifth. And she said, I don't want to know. I said, but I know what you're getting for your birthday. I don't want to know. I said, Mom, I know what you're getting for your birthday. She said, if you tell me a secret, I'm going to tell you a secret. I said, you're getting a blue dress. She said, and you were adopted. And that's how I found out I was adopted. And so, Maureen and I looked at this. And, and I, we went downstairs to my mom and said, what is, what's adopted? And my mom said, you were chosen. Now shut up and go back to bed. I said, Okay. Uh, it affected it affected me. I was fine, but I was affected by other people at school. I was teased mercifully. Uh, 
my children that I was illegitimate, that I was the bastard. Still, mm-hmm. I still get that today. I was, you know, illegitimate. I was the bastard child. I thought at a point that the reason I was put out for adoption is because uh, my mother knew I was illegitimate. Mm-hmm. And I thought maybe I was put in boarding school because Jane knew or she didn't know. I was afraid to talk to Jane or my dad about that in case they didn't know that I was a bastard child or illegitimate. And I felt that if they found out, if they knew what I knew from what the kids were telling me, they would give me away also, just like my birth mother Irene did back in 1950, 1945. So it scared the crap out of me, to be honest with you, because now I'm dealing with illegitimacy. I'm dealing with being a bastard. Because I went to the dictionary. I wrote about this in my first book. I went to the dictionary and looked up bastard. I didn't know what it meant until I read I know what it meant. And it scared the hell out of me. And I was, uh, yeah, I was. But unfortunately, that opened up to be the cause of other things happening in my life uh, that uh, caused me to walk away from everybody until, you know, until finally I met Pauline. And ultimately, I didn't tell my, you know, telling my parents all this stuff back in the 80s. Did you, were you able to talk about some of this with your dad at any point? I know he was obviously very focused on career. He ends up remarrying, getting into politics, having tremendous responsibility. Did you ever have conversations about some of those difficult events in your childhood with your dad? I didn't talk to anybody. I talked to nobody at all. Um, And what happened was because I was so... uh, because all these things, all these things working on me and what have you, uh, it didn't help me in my schoolwork. Um, uh, and uh, I think about that on a regular basis. I, I was laid other things determined my attitude for the remainder of the day, and those were you know, good things. I uh, uh, had been opened up. My dad put my dad, my mom, put me in a uh, after school program for one year in third grade. And the after school program, the uh, man in the after school program was a pedophile. Mm-hmm. I we nobody knew that then, uh, but for all of third grade, uh, he sexually molested me for a year of my life, and took me up to Santa Monica Mountains. He was nice to me through he showed me how to throw a football, a baseball, a basketball, you know, a lot of things that I'm really very good at. He taught me. Uh, this is what happens a lot of times in divorce. You know, the red, like, you, you, you divorce is when you're away from your dad, who usually could do those things. You know, some other person can step in and do those things. Dad, we rode horses, shot ground squirrels, we did all those fun things, but baseball throw, base football, all these other things. You know, this this guy was doing, and ultimately took me up the Santa Monica Mountains on a given week and took uh, new pictures of me. And then had me develop the photographs three days later in his apartment in Santa Monica, wherever he lived, put his hand on my shoulder and said, wouldn't your mother like to have a copy of this? And that's when I walked away from my mom, my dad, God, and everybody else. Uh, Because Mm -hmm. then I knew, I knew I was going to hell. I knew if they knew, they would kick me out. And uh, I did everything possible to get out of my mom's house. And ultimately, it took till I went to high school and moved in with my dad. Uh, on weekends and when I was going to Loyola. So it was, uh, it had a tremendous effect on me, the teasing I took in school when I was like six, seven, eight years old. Uh, uh, and so it begets, begets. Now, conversation with my dad. I don't tell my dad about the sexual molestation or my mother until 1987 because I wrote a book called On the Outside Looking In where I'm kind of telling the story. And that's when I told my mom and, and told my dad the story. Uh, and uh, like somebody called me, and uh, a friend of mine called me and said, what would have happened if those photos would have come out before uh, before the book came out? And I said, well, I wouldn't have been alive to be, even talk about the book. I'd be dead. Because suicide, suicide is an option for children who are going through molestation. That becomes an option. And it became an option for me. I didn't choose it. Uh, but if those photos would come out, I might have chosen it. And the photos were not destroyed until 
I think 2007, when the molester died and his uh, his uh, sister-in-law called me or he wrote me a letter, said, Don has finally died and you can find the rest because the photographs have all been destroyed that he took of you and so many other children that were in a chest at the end of his bed where he mm-hmm. lived. He did hundreds of them. Mm-hmm. People need to understand that, that that's how a child is blackmailed. And, and react to. So I didn't finish college. Um, I did, I've done some good things in my life and what have you. Uh, but I always have in the back of my mind, you know, the fact that I'm trying to overcome all those things, you know, as a child. Because I, I look and see what could have I accomplished had I not let those things help destroy relationships. And what, I have no friends from my childhood. Not, I didn't want any friends really from my childhood because I felt if they figured if they knew what I knew about me, they would have walked away anyway. So where you might have friends from your childhood forever, I don't have those forever friends from my childhood because of those things that happened in my life. So I've gone out and tried to overachieve racing boats that's at five world records of power bar racing, Alpha World Champion, radio for 27, 28 years and and what have you. So I've done those things and what have you, but uh, uh, you're still dealing with the fact of those photographs and and thinking about the children out there today are going through the same things I went through. You know, you know, it takes the child seven times to tell an adult what happened to them before the adult listens for the first time. Seven times. Mm-hmm. At what point do you say, "Screw it, I'm not going to," you know, "I'm not going to tell that conversation again," and you don't. And it seems adults always believe the teacher first, the, the minister, the priest, grandpa. They seem to always believe the adult who's done the damage than listen to the child who has been damaged. And that nothing's changed. It still goes on today. Still goes on today. Michael, I'm very grateful for you sharing your story. I know you've shared it before, and I think it's helped a lot of people because your willingness to talk about this as incredibly painful as it's been for you, I think helps other people be more aware of how this happens and how to stop it. And I know that's one of the reasons you are such a passionate advocate for kids Mm -hmm. as you are both in your pro-life work and against sex trafficking. So thank you for doing that because I think it makes a big difference in your later on when you were coming out and getting involved in your radio career, getting involved in writing your books and doing your own work alongside your father's political career, did you, you know, were there any other things that motivated you in how you saw the world? You were very conser- you're conservative, you're pro-life, pro-family. You ha- you talked about your faith. Are there any other conversations you had? You know, was there anything else from your father and what he was doing that impacted you during your career? Well, you know, it's just, like I told you the story of flying on Air Force One, that really impacted me. Uh, mm-hmm. The fact, it, it impacted, I think, everybody. You know, when he was the first president to be shot and, and survive, uh, mm-hmm. and and the fact he dedicated his life to God. He didn't get angry in, in my book. You know, in my book, Lesson My Father Taught Me, the last lesson he taught me was forgiveness. And And so what we were talking about a moment ago, is learning to forgive, like forgive yourself. You can start there too. Forgive yourself. You know, but I, I remember the, the way I treated people because what I went through, I had to forgive myself for the way I treated people. And so I forget my dad can forgive John Hinckley for trying to kill him. And and I tell this story when I go out. You, I could go into a room, and people say to people, "Raise your hand if you know the Lord's Prayer." Everybody's hand goes up. I say. Okay, raise your hand if you live it. When you see all the heads. I know two people who lived it. My father and Pope John Paul. Because both of them <laughs> forgave the two people who tried to murder them mm. before they even went back to the White House or went back to the papal seat and back as Pope John Paul did. And I think that God honored those things. By allowing them to get together, the Protestant and the Catholic get together, both of them deep in their faith, of course, get together and look at the commonality they have between them on 
both forgiving those who tried to murder them, but the other thing, getting communism out of the building, bringing freedom to Poland and around the globe and mm-hmm. bringing down the Berlin Wall. Uh, and I think it really it started there because it gave them something, gave them a, a, a place to plant their flag. And, and they did that. And like my dad said, I think God kept me alive for a reason. I have a higher purpose. And unfortunately, you have people who saw that differently and said, well, he's different now than he was before he was shot. Well, heck, yes, he was. He was shot and almost died. What have you? And so he changed in that way. Uh, and and so, you know, it, those kind of things really meant a lot to me, seeing my dad in, in that way. Uh, forgiveness, if you will. His humor. Um uh, You know, the humor was the same with you or with me. I'm so excited to introduce a must-listen, extremely bingeable new podcast brought to you by Coronation Media. The podcast is called Firebreaker and is a fictional rendition of the story of St. George and the Dragon. It was created by fathers to introduce strong Christian heroes for their boys and girls to look up to. And let's be honest, we're living in a time where there isn't an emphasis on moral character of strong male characters for young boys in media. The princess too in Firebreakers is a model of Christian virtue, just like what I'd hope my daughter to grow up to be like. Firebreakers is done in old school radio style with sound effects and is guaranteed to engage your kids. The portrayal of dragons as captivating symbols of evil is masterfully executed. It's kind of like spiritual warfare training for your kids. Plus the podcast features captivating voice performances, including Wizards of Waverly Place star, David Henry, and The Chosen's Elizabeth Tabish, who plays Mary Magdalene, as well as a full orchestra score by a Hollywood producer, Kevin Casca. The podcast Firebreakers is available on Apple and Spotify for free. So go download it right now or visit firebreakerseries.com. That's firebreakerseries.com. You know, like the day was shot. Nancy, I forgot the duck. I hope all you doctors are all Republicans. But what does he say to me? He tells me, that if I'm ever going to get shot, don't be wearing a brand new suit. I said, what? Yeah, I wore a brand new suit yesterday. It's the first time I wore it. And last time I saw it, they cut that suit off of me. It was in shreds in the corner of the hospital room. So if you're ever going to get shot, Michael, don't be wearing a new suit. I said, all right. He said, young man who shot me. I said, Hinkley. He said, John Hinkley. Yes. Understand his parents in the oil business. They said, well, yes, they are. Understand they live in Denver. I said, yes, they do. He said, do you think they have any money? I said, Dad, of course they have money. This is six hours after he's off the table. I course they have money. They're in the oil business in Denver. My dad looks at me and says, do you think they'd ever buy me a new suit? <laughs> so this is the way he is with me. Wow. So th- this is the way he is. It, 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 things about him, he knew you would be nervous in his presence, mm-hmm. so he used his humor to kind of make him soften it for everybody. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I remember that so well during those times, but there's a part in the movie that would not happen today, unfortunately, in America that we live in. And that part is when he's shot and he wakes up in the hospital room. Who's sitting in the chair in it with his rosary? Tip O'Neill. Tip O'Neill's in my dad's hospital room with, with a rosary praying with my father. That doesn't happen today. That doesn't mm-hmm. happen today, and that that's what we've lost in America. Why do you think? Why do you think that is, uh, Michael? That's such a good point. That you know, we, it's so partisan, so divisive, well, and in some ways, we've lost our humanity in politics. What, what, what do you? Why do you think? I think that a is? lot of it's social media. Uh, uh, mm. I think a lot of it because people uh, don't no, no, can't talk to each other. Your families, nobody talks to each other anymore. They don't communicate. But, you know, I said to a Republican uh, group the other day, I was talking to, not an uh, actual speech, but I just happened to be in a room with them. And I said, you know, you guys, let me just say something. The Republican Party is the, is the minority party. You spend more time kicking people out of it than you bringing people into it. And you, you can only bring people into it with a message. And my father had a message that brought people in. And he got elected. Because Republicans, Democrats, Independents voted for him because he had that kind of a message. And I said, let me just say something to you. He has a daughter, Patty, who didn't vote for him, was a member of the Peace and Freedom Party, led a march on Washington, D.C. when he was president of the United States with a friend of hers. My dad invited them into the Oval Office and said, what's your problem? 
What's your gripe? His son, Ron, is an atheist. All right? He didn't vote for his father. So you have two of his children didn't vote for him. One's an atheist. Mm -hmm. One led a march on Washington, D.C. But you know something? At Thanksgiving, they were at the table. They weren't mm -hmm. kicked off the table. They were still allowed in. You know, and dad then would talk politics and what have you. Mm -hmm. But they were still at the table. And so we, I see people out there today, which really ticks me off, who pretend like they knew Ronald Reagan, like they've always been at the dinner table, who I never saw at the dinner table. But yet they pretend they were at the dinner mm -hmm. table no more than me mm -hmm. and other people that were there mm -hmm. all the time. And so it seems they could drop my dad's name, but they didn't learn any lessons. And it's really about learning lessons. I learned lessons from my mother. I learned lessons from my father. You know, it's about, it is about being gracious. It is about, mm. you know, being forgiving and what have you. And uh, I don't think we don't, we don't, we don't want lessons mm. anymore because we'd rather fight than learn anything about anybody. And that's, that's, that's really unfortunate. Are you concerned about the direction both the Democrat and the Republican Party has gone in the way we talk about each other, in the way that, and I don't just mean policy disagreements, those are, you know, good disagreements to have, but in the rhetoric that's used, sometimes the accusations that are wielded against one another, what do you think about the way politics is today between the parties? Again, I think a lot. And what would your father, what do you think your father would think about it? There they go again, uh, basically with everybody. Mm -hmm. It's... Uh... It, it, yeah, I think both parties. I think one party more than the other. And they, it, but it, but again, it's it's the name calling that. What did my dad say? Never speak ill of, an, of another Republican, and he never did. But today we have no problem speaking ill of everybody. And and so you'd say, why do we do that? Why why, why were, and and by speaking ill and by speaking ill he didn't mean policy disagreements. What would he mean? Would he mean character char attacks? Yeah, character attacks. Speaking ill of another Republican. You know, it's uh, mm -hmm. it's really saying. Go back to uh, Tip O'Neill for a moment. Tip O'Neill, my dad, passed the largest tax break in American history. Tip O'Neill was Speaker of the House, Democrat House, Republican President. What my dad do? My dad invited Tip O'Neill to the White House for dinner with his wife. At dinner, next day or two, he'd go back to his office. Tip O'Neill would and tell his staff, "I'm going to carry the legislation to the floor of the House." And they looked and said, "You know, it will pass because uh, back then they were bull weevil Democrats. Today mm -hmm. they're blue dog. Just uh, age wise, <laughs> I'm helping out there." And uh, and so he uh, he so he said. And they said it'll pass. He said, yeah. Well, what did the president promise you? What did he tell you at dinner that caused you to do this? He said the president never talked about the taxes all that long. He never talked about taxes. Then what in the hell did he talk about? He talked about the greatness of America, the goodness of all of our people, and how the two of us working together can make it better for everybody. And before I knew it, I'm having a glass of wine with the president. We're telling Irish stories. And today I'm telling you I'm going to take the legislation to the floor of the Congress, and I know it'll pass. And he said, oh, by the way, on the way out the door, he did say one thing. Whoever votes for it, I promise not to campaign against them in the next election. With it just kind of <laughs> weak and nut. But again, that's, we don't do that anymore. I don't know if Ronald Reagan had many regrets, but I do know I have read reports that he shared about one of them which was, you know, in his passionate pro-life support, he had a proclamation that he did as president where he instituted Sanctity of Life Sunday in 1988. And he talked about how every unborn child has a right to life and that the government, the constitution should protect that child's right to life. So he was very pro-life. This was unprecedented for a president to do this. And I think it made a big impact on the people of the United States. When he was governor though, he passed a law before Roe v. Wade in 1973, in the 60s, he passed a law that permitted abortions in some instances. And later on, it was reported that he expressed regret for legalizing some of these instances of abortion while he was governor because he felt that it was the wrong thing to do. Did you ever talk to him about this or what is your perspective on on this part of his uh, his record? He always sit there and said, you know, 
it's just all the people who are pro-choice have already been born. I thought that was one of the great lines he ever he ever gave. But he was passionately pro-life. And I think part of it might have been because me coming in the family, being adopted and what have you. Uh, but we never really talked about it. He talked about more with Maureen, uh, mm-hmm. who was really, she was part of the uh, Republican Party. She was a lot of stuff. Uh, but he was, he was, things he was passionate about was pro-life. Things he was passionate about was bringing freedom to the to the world, um, and it it's uh, it's unfortunate we're in a position in the world we live in today, where and I think one of the things he said when we become when we cease to be one nation under God, we become a nation gone under, mm-hmm. and I think prolific. I think that's where we're at today. We've gone under, in 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 every single way, uh, and what have you, and and that's uh, that's unfortunate. I I think we. We're not going to change anything till we get that back, but it has to start there. Uh, I also think another thing. I think that, uh, and I say this, I used to say on my radio show, problem with abortion, the problem with the border, too much money made on both sides of the issue. Mm-hmm. Where both sides of the issue are, you know, are passionate about their beliefs, but if either side wins, the money stops. And I think there's, I think a lot of it's about dollars and cents, unfortunately. Mm-hmm. And the children pay the price. The aborted kids pay the price. Uh, you have the black families been destroyed because of abortion. Mm-hmm. Back in 1965, when the government used to give black mothers, African American mothers, they would give them money up until I think the tenth child, mm-hmm. and then after that they wouldn't give them money. But they only got money if the father of the child did not live in the home. Mm. So they started kicking. Fathers were now not living in the home of their spouse and their children. And you wonder why the fathers are not out of not fathers aren't in the home because the government only paid you if the fathers weren't in the home. And they only paid you up to a certain amount of kids. And after that, they were going to pay you. So what would happen? You have the, you have the black families mm. aborting in, per, in the percentages that are just unbelievable because of that. And so you have to go back a lot of times, you see the media, who doesn't do their job, never tells you the history of something. Mm-hmm. You, know, you can't solve a problem unless you know the, the start of it. Where, where, what's the history of it? What's going on? Or you look at the uh, look at the talk about, let's make the Supreme Court larger. Well, why is Supreme Court got? Why was Donald Trump able to do what he did? Because what the senator from Nevada did back in nineteen whatever nineties, when he changed the rules on how you elect, you know, you know people to the court, he changed it from sixty votes to fifty votes, and he was warned, "What goes around comes around," and when the Republicans took over, they changed it on the Supreme Court. And that's why you have Supreme Court where it is. And this is what happens. But again, the media does not tell you the basis of it. Or you go back to the 1970s and say, geez, how come we have such a large deficit? Well, up until 1972, the President of the United States had the authority to hold back funds that he thought were budget busters. But that was Richard Nixon. And so after Watergate, everybody was mad at Nixon and the Congress took that authority away from him and took it on themselves. So since 1973, the Congress has been charged of the budget, not the president. And if the president doesn't spend, I don't know if people know this or even know this, if you don't spend every dollar that is allocated by the Congress of the United States, you can be taken to court by the Congress of the United States. My father was threatened twice with that. So again, that's what makes me mad at the media is the fact they don't give you source, they don't give you background, they don't tell you so you can make an honest decision about anything. What do you think, Michael, about the direction the Republican Party is going now? I think there's a lot of uh, good that the party's trying to do, but in the last couple months, the last three months, the party changed the platform uh, during the Republican National Convention, took most of pro-life out of the platform, took marriages between a man and a woman out of the platform. What's your sense of if if your father were alive today, what he would think about that, what kind of voice he'd be right now, and what is your take on that? 
my take on that is you're one of three people to read the platform. <laughs> That's my take on that. Well, let's because say not, when, not when just people, the platform. When people it's, vote, yeah. when people mm -hmm. vote, they vote to the most likable candidate about the issue mm -hmm. that they like. And that that's what they do. Uh, but nobody really reads the platform or what have you. They'll say it at the convention. My dad talked about the convention in 1976, bold colors, all these other things. Didn't do any good. The president still lost back in 1976. So not many people pay that much attention to the platform. I mean, activists do pay attention to it. But outside the activists, they're just looking at what's in the news, what are you saying, what are you going to do for me lately, and what have you? They're not looking really at at very much else in it, uh, if you will. And so, if the platform is the platform, if you read it, you can be upset by it, you can like it, or what have you. But it really comes down to the candidates. What is each candidate saying about what they're going to do or not do if they are elected to the Senate, to the House, or what have you? I think the Republicans need to pay attention to the Senate, make sure that they control the Senate. If Harris wins, you got to have a stopgap somewhere. Mm -hmm. I think Republicans ha have made a mistake for generations. Democrats, Democrats, you know, don't go for the don't don't go for the big win at the top so much, but they control. What do they control? School boards, mm -hmm. mayors, governors. So on and so forth. And, and the Republicans always are reaching for the stars. And they forget about the mayors, school board, city council, all these, like here in California. They're the Democrats. Why? Because Republicans don't pay attention to it. They're too involved in the presidency. They need to be more involved mm. where we're involved, with our children, with the school, with the mayors, and all these things. Mm. We, have a, we have a homeless problem in Los Angeles. All Democrats in charge, all Democrats, we, no Republicans, uh, and and that, that's a terrible thing that the Republicans do. And I think the leadership at the national level needs to start rethinking how can we be involved more locally at at those levels, because Democrats are involved in those levels. And if they win the governorship and the presidency, whew, that's the cherry on the cake, because they don't really need it if they control everything else. And Republicans need to start controlling the other side of the building. It's a really good point, Michael. Thank you. Listen, it's been such an honor to get to talk to you. Do you have any final thoughts you want to share about the, the moment we're in, the movie, or the incredible life of your dad? You know, the, the, go see the movie uh, and stay mm -hmm. till the end of it. All the way through the credits till you see the child read the letter about the goldfish at the end of the movie. <laughs> but it's a great movie about him fighting communism in Hollywood and his life story in that way. If you're going to see it, to see politics, it's not really a polit political movie. It's his, it's a movie about him fighting you know, communism and where it came from, how we grew up, and all the way to tear down this wall speech. And you know, so many of us fight fight obstacles in our lives. Something happens that's bad to us and we give up. See this movie, every obstacle my dad hit he just went right past it. Mm. And it's really something you need to learn. Don't give up because you failed. And look at the people who are successful today. Every single one of them has failed. Every single one of them. And look at it in that way. So don't let failure control your day. Mm. And don't let somebody else's attitude control, control mm. those failures. Be your own person. Be your own leader. And marry a, if you're a guy, marry a really good woman like Colleen. And we'll <laughs> celebrate our 49th wedding anniversary, November 7th. Because Amazing. without her, without her, I tell people, I would be in a tent outside on the street. I said it'd be a damn nice tent, but it'd still be a tent. Michael, thanks for being a living witness of what you're preaching and showing that persistence and that strong character. Thank you so much. It's just been a real pleasure. And I hope everyone goes and sees the movie, Reagan, if they haven't already. Thank you so much. And it's going to be on digital very soon. Fantastic. Very good. good. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much. You. God bless.
Bye-bye. A huge thank you to our partner, EWTN. EWTN is the largest religious network reaching millions of people with the truth of the faith, entertainment, and news. Check them out at EWTN.com.